Robert Lecker is a Canadian scholar, author, and Green Shields Professor of English at McGill University, where he specializes in Canadian literature. He received the H. Noel Fieldhouse Award for Distinguished Teaching at McGill University in 1985. In 2012, Lecker was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in recognition of his influential studies on literary value in English Canada and Canadian cultural identity. In addition to his teaching and academic writing, Lecker has held a number of prominent positions in the Canadian publishing industry throughout his career. He co-founded ECW Press in 1977. He co-edited the Canadian literary journal Essays on Canadian Writing between 1975 and 2004. He has edited several anthologies of Canadian and international literature and he currently heads a literary agency in Montreal, the Robert Lecker Agency. Welcome to The Bibliophile. Thank you very much, Nigel. I'd like to talk about Canadian literary agents, past, present, and future. And the reason that I'm here today is because of an article that I read of yours in the papers of the Bibliographical Society of Canada, 2016 spring-fall, entitled Canadian Authors and Their Literary Agents, 1890 to 1977. At the end of that article, you say, Canadian writers have relied on a web of formal and informal associations in order to further their interests ever since Gilbert Parker signed on with agent A.P. Watt in 1892. Those associations have profoundly altered the way in which Canadian authors are perceived by their publishers and their readers. How? How? Well, the fact is that most people who look at a book, most people who buy a book, even many authors, don't really understand the role that literary agents play in bringing a book to market. Uh, For many consumers, they go into a bookstore or they go online, they see a book, they read the author biography, they see a nice cover, but they really have no idea about the workings that enable a book or a manuscript to get to a publisher. They have no idea about the kind of deliberations that take place in order for a book to be accepted. They have no idea about the role that literary agents play in that in that process. And agents since the turn of the 20th century have been seen as gatekeepers for publishers. Increasingly over time Uh, publishers began to delegate the process of that gatekeeping to literary agencies because they were simply overcome with the volume of material that they received. So what was established was a trusted network of agents uh, who could look at books, make suggestions to authors, and eventually bring them to the publishers. And The publishers would know, well, at least this book had some kind of stamp of approval that it had received. Uh, Mm -hmm. prior to its submission. And uh, a lot of authors are very puzzled by the fact that when they go to publishers' websites, particularly larger publishers, uh, often the publishers will say, well, you know, you can't even come to us unless you have an agent. Right. So, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of mystique, I think, around how do you get an agent, what do agents do? And uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about the role of literary agents is that they're not simply conduits to publishers, but that they often help the writer to materially craft and change the book, the narrative, the novel, the work of nonfiction, in a way that makes it more saleable. In other words, uh, from my point of view, literary agents participate in the creative process. Yeah, and do you think that screws up the creative process? I don't think it screws up the creative process. I think that at all levels the creative process is a negotiated process. Uh, When authors understand that the kind of works they produce are a function of how they make their money, how much money they make, how much time they have, where they live, uh, what kind of uh, infrastructure exists around them in order to get their book to market, how they deal with agents, how they deal with publishers, how they deal with book designers, how the publisher deals with bookstores, 
the process of literary creation is never innocent. Uh, it gets impacted by all kinds of forces. I guess what I'm talking about is the imagination. Mm -hmm. Like if, if I come up with something that's genuinely original and some literary agent comes along and says, there's no way that's going to sell. Maybe a great work of literature has been lost as yeah. a result. That may be the case. Um, I know that, I don't know what the rate is for uh, most other literary agents, but the rejection rate is very, very high, which means that there may well be, uh, you know, the diamond that comes your way that just you don't think it's going to work and you reject it and then you find out a year later that it's become a bestseller. Mm -hmm. So uh, not everybody has perfect judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, authors are upset when they submit their books to agents because they put a lot of work into it, a lot of creative imagination, as you say, uh, only to find that they, they can't get the, in the agent's door. But uh, agents are not perfect. They make mistakes. Uh, sometimes they turn down uh, wonderful works because it just doesn't, it just doesn't do it for them. Well, as have so many publishers over the years. I mean, so many of the greatest works that have ever been produced have been rejected roundly, haven't they? That's right, and uh, I can't remember the specific instances, but there's all kinds of stories out there about books that have circulated to dozens of publishers before they found the right home and then became profound bestsellers. Yeah. Problem is, if you do the rounds and try and get your your text accepted by an agent and they all say no, you can't basically say, well, screw you, I'm going to go directly to the publisher, because as you said, publishers don't deal directly with all with authors anymore, in, in the English-speaking world anyway. You can't, that's right. So the irony is that in that system, your best alternative is, in fact, to find another agent, right. uh, because you won't be able to find a publisher directly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, whereas a lot of authors think that the relationship is between the author and the publisher, more often than not it's between the author and one agent or different agents if it turns out that they get rejected by the first one they approach. Yeah, you mention in, in the article that I referred to that agencies alter the nature, pace, and result of publishing. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, if a book comes in the door... One of the things the agent is thinking about right away is, um, how does this grab me? How does its title work on me? How do its first few sentences work on me? I like to tell authors, as I tell my own students, uh, that when you submit a work to a publisher, you've got about one minute uh, to make an impression. And if uh, I read a page and I don't want to turn to the next page, it's game over. So what the author is going to, uh, excuse me, what the agency is going to try to do is to help the author get to that point where the publisher wants to turn the page. But it's not just um, in the quality of the writing, it's in the title of the book, it's in the premise of the book, and it's in the kind of questions that the agent can encourage the author to pose and answer in those very few st first few pages. And what are those questions? What happened? Why is this happening? What's going to happen? Why is that person sick? Why is that person so angry? Why is the weather so bad? What the hell is going to happen next? You're not going to answer those questions. You're going to you want the reader to to want to know want to know the answer. Eventually, they have to be answered. Right. But in the beginning, what you want to do is pose those questions. You have to get to the bottom of page one and say, "There's tension here." Yeah. And I've got to go on to page two because I already don't know what's going to happen. But that's very, very rare skill uh, for somebody to be able to do that. And particularly in a novel, uh, it becomes very important to do that quickly. It's funny, you know, because I, I interviewed John Galassi not that long ago, and I asked him the same question. He, his answer was exactly what you said. And I thought, as a reader, I typically have given a novel a hundred pages and I've just slogged it out and then put it down. You well, guys, you've got, you you've guys got just more give patience it. than me. Well yeah and so <laughs> of course I'm I'm not gonna give I'm not gonna give my uh, it's it's as if I expect it to get there are books. I'm thinking of the, the what was it, the tattoo the the, the Swedish 
the girl with the dragon tattoo. Mm-hmm. I didn't read it. My wife read it. She said it took like 200 pages. It was dragging, and but afterwards mm-hmm. it caught fire, and she read the rest of the series. So what about books like that? I'm too impatient for books like that. I actually haven't read that book, but uh, in terms of my own personal reading, I'll do a lot more than give a book the first page because usually by the time I get to a book, I've selected it pretty carefully. I've read some reviews. I'm interested in it, so I'm not going to give it one page. I'm going to give it a good 50 pages or so like that. You know, if after 50 pages it doesn't do it for me, life is too short. Right. You know, I'm just going to move on to the next one. (laughs) Well, for me, anyway, Anna Karenina, I, I crashed out after 100 pages. I've done that about three times. And Middle March, 100 pages. These are two of the greatest novels supposedly ever written, so I, I feel like I need to give them another chance. Mm-hmm. What about an author who's written in my Middle March and meets a, a, an agent, and I'm, th- I'm assuming you're typical of agents, like you? Well, uh Again, the agent has to be interested in the work. And uh, if the agent isn't interested in the work, personally invested in it, how can they sell it properly? Uh, we, we tend to forget that literary agents are salespeople. Yeah. And they have to believe in what they're selling. They've got a vested interest. They've got a vested interest because ethical literary agents only work on commission. Right. They don't charge fees. So um, you've got to really believe in what you're selling, and you've got to think you can do a good job selling it. And I'm pretty sure that most salespeople would say that they can't sell something unless they believe in it, unless mm. they feel passionate about it. So that's, that's one test that I apply uh, to myself. You know, do I feel passionate about this to invest in it and take it forward? You quote uh, Janet Wolf, who says, Art is a social product. So, uh, uh, again, a, you know, a novel is typically one person writing it. That's how most people think of it. A movie, on the other hand, is a sort of a collaborative effort. And so you're saying that art is more like a movie than a novel? I'm saying that, that really all art is social in the sense that it's collaborative. Uh, writers don't write in a vacuum. Um, they may sit in a room alone, but they're not writing in a vacuum. They're affected by the weather, they're affected by interest rates, they're affected by the balance in their bank account, they're affected by the politics that swirl around them, they're affected by how they feel that day, they're affected by their doctor's visit. That's all going on in their own head though. It's going on in their own head, but but their ideas and the creative process comes out of an exchange with their daily activities, and the daily activities bring them into contact with, you know, a range of circumstances that inevitably affect the work. I think that back in the old days we thought of the, you know, the closeted writer genius who was all alone with his or her inspiration, um, thinking great thoughts. And, you know, the whole idea of inspiration really derives from the idea that the artist is inspired by God, that literally the artist breathes God's breath. Um, But uh, we don't, we don't, believe that anymore, at least not too many of us believe that anymore. So I think it's probably more common today to see the writer as a force within the many forces that surround her. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the article, uh, Canadian Authors and Their Literary Agents, 1890 to 1977, you, uh, you point to what you call a common misperception that literary agencies agents were not active in Canada until the founding of Matty Molinero's Canadian Writers Service in the early 1950s. So why is that a misconception? It's a misconception on a couple of levels. First of all, if you look at any literary history of Canada, they're all going to say that the first literary agency in Canada was Matty Molinero's Canadian Writers Services in Toronto, established in 1950. That's not true. Uh, In fact, the first literary agency, professional literary agency, uh, in in Canada was established in 1946 in Montreal. It was established by a woman by the name of Doris Hedges. Um, Mm. But informal literary agents have existed in Canada, you know, since the 1920s and 1930s. That is, individuals who are well-connected, who might have been in the publishing industry, who might have had contacts with people overseas, often worked to assist writers, even though they hadn't established what could be called professional literary agencies 
Um, in addition, Canadian writers often went outside the country to find professional literary agents because, precisely because they didn't exist in Canada. Mm -hmm. So some of Canada's best writers, um, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, found themselves going to New York and London to find agents simply because those agencies didn't exist in, in, in Canada. And they didn't exist in Canada because there was not much of a market for the, for the books? Well, I forget the exact figure, but um, I was just looking at this the other day when the, when the Massey Commission report was published in 1951. They said that in Canada in 1948, uh, a total of 16 novels had been published that year. <laughs> now, if, if you're uh, living in a country where only 16 novels are published in a given year, either that means there's not many writers submitting novels, or it means there's all kinds of writers, but very few of them are finding publishers. And in that kind of environment, uh, if one were a writer, uh, one would feel pretty frustrated. Uh, because you would look around you and say, nobody I know is getting published, mm -hmm. and only the best-selling authors are those 16 people. How the heck am I ever supposed to break into this world? So some of them would go overseas and you know try to find agents in, in New York or London, but, but then, it's, it, then it came back to the same problem as we have in publishing today, and that is the publisher would say, well, what is the author's platform? Uh, by, by which they mean, um, what has the author done? How much have they published? becomes a kind of chicken and egg situation. The publisher doesn't want to take on a writer who doesn't have any track record, but the writer can't get a track record because they can't find an agent. So um, this is the situation that Canada was in, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, and the, the only reason that cycle got broken was the founding of the Canada Council in 1957. Mm -hmm where uh, the government decided to inject money into the publishing industry, to inject money uh, into the magazine industry, to inject money into the cultural industries in Canada in such a way that that chicken and egg cycle could be broken. Prior to that, then the Canadian publishers, obviously, they weren't going to make any money publishing Canadian authors. No, they I didn't mean, that, make any money. Because if they could make money, they would do so, right? Right. They didn't make any money, and in fact, even in 1955, there was quite a well-known conference of writers held at uh, Queen's University where uh, publishers came and writers came and critics came, and, uh, you know, um, the publisher who was there basically said, you know, there's no money to be made in Canada on this. We're, we're doing it out of a sense of, uh, you know, national interest and national purpose, but um, there's no money to be made. It's not a very inspiring for, you know, up-and-coming publishers to hear that. Yeah, although I'm just th I'm just thinking of the, in 1948 there was the Indian File series of poetry that well it started in, I guess it started in 48 mm -hmm. that McClellan and Stewart put out beautiful books. Mm -hmm. Uh, why would they do that then? Just again, out of the goodness of their heart? I'm, I'm not familiar with the history of that, of that series, but um, even back in 1955, uh, if you look at the history of McClelland and Stewart, uh, they recently were able to launch their new Canadian Library series, which is a series that made them a lot of money. I mean, paperback reprints of Canadian authored books was because they were able to get grants from the Canada Council. Uh, in the early years to, yeah. you know, to capitalize that series. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to take it forward. So that capitalization, that injection of capital was necessary even for publishers like McClelland and Stewart. Although I was, I'm surprised, though, because I know Jack McClellan would have made a point of not accepting government grants. But they did. But they did. <laughs> take my word for it. <laughs> okay. He made a point of telling people he didn't, but obviously they, they must have. The correspondence is there okay. to prove it. <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, just jumping back a little bit uh, in time, there was you referenced the fact that publication in Canada alone secured no American copyright. That what, can you just explore that a little bit for me? Well, the copyright laws in Canada were very different from the copyright laws in the United States and Great Britain. Um, in fact, there were, uh, until, you know, quite late, like the 1950s or the 1960s, I can't remember the exact date, uh, an insufficiency of, of copyright laws to protect Canadian authors. So, ironically, in order to gain copyright in a work, 
a Canadian author often would have to first publish it in the United States or Great Britain in order to secure that copyright. In or, Canada? In, or, in order, Yes, in order to secure it in Canada. So they would first have to protect their rights by publishing their work initially outside the country. So no wonder they went to get agents in those countries. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. it had everything to do with the insufficiency of the copyright laws. Hmm. That's extraordinary, isn't it, really? It's extraordinary, but it's just another one of the, a series of legal, material, um, structural issues mm -hmm. that affected Canadian publishing. And we, we have to remember always that you could have the same two books, the same book in Canada and the same book in the United States. And if a book in Canada sells 2,000 copies, chances of it breaking even on its publication costs are not very high. But if you take the same book and it sells 10 times the number in the United States, that is 20,000, chances of it breaking even are very high. So another thing that Canada suffers from is just what I would call a sort of demographic disadvantage. Right. Does that still hold true today then? or I think it does still hold true. And, and right. remember that when we distribute a book here, well, of course, there's all kinds of centers, say, between Toronto and Winnipeg, but not at the same density level in the United States. So if you just think about a book and how it's going to get into bookstores, however rare that is these days, there's so many more bookstores in the same distance between two cities in the United States as there are in Canada that... It, it simply makes, from the point of view of infrastructure, the, the, the distribution of a title is already at a disadvantage in Canada because it has to reach fewer points that are farther apart. Simple transit costs, delivery costs. I'm put in mind of Greyhound closing down its uh, routes in Western exactly. Canada. Yeah. Exactly. And how do you get books into the Canadian North? Yeah, we've got a one big honking country makes things not that easy. Well, it's, it's, it's great that it's, it's big like that, but it also presents all kinds of distribution issues that aren't faced by countries with more population density. Okay, so the sort of official literary agent kicked off in, in the 50s then. 40s. This is the woman in Montreal, Montreal you're talking about, that in fact there hasn't been much... Not, you don't know much about her. No one does. I know everything about her. Okay. <laughs> I, I think you said in here she, someone needs to do some more research no, on that's her. That's me. That's me. Because um, when, I, when I came to her name and realized that she had been written out of history, uh, that's when I decided to focus in on her. So that, that is, in fact, what I'm writing right now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so she's, she's really quite a fascinating figure. So what's her name again? Doris Hedges. How did you go about learning about her? Well, because there's so little, it became a very interesting uh, mystery story, really. How do you piece together the, you know, the fragments of somebody's life who's basically been erased from literary history? And uh, what you do is you work with a, a great research assistant, uh, right. like I'm fortunate enough to have. To, What's that uh, person's name? Sabrina Oguzzi. Okay. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to uh, be working with her and uh, with another woman before her who we're talking about archival research, we're talking about looking up letters, we're talking about correspondence with people who might have known her, we're looking up uh, family records and newspaper stories. Uh, this woman was actually quite prolific and uh, because she was, in addition to being a literary agent, was also a novelist and a poet and a radio broadcaster and um, never heard of a public address person and was very well known in the community for many many years in Montreal <laughs> so in fact was one of the better known uh, literary personalities so i just became fascinated by the idea that sh that nobody knew a thing about her uh, anymore and in fact she she had two novels published with McClellan and Stewart so that suggests that at that time uh, she was quite well recognized so she just hasn't had good PR. Well, she didn't succeed as a literary agent, um, but in fact, she was quite a character. And um, family members still alive? I'm assuming. No family members. Well, distant family members are still alive. Distant family members. But um, she was a relentless self-promoter, and uh, she was also given to exaggerating her own success, which endeared me to her because she was a kind of very good saleswoman or at least she thought she was a good saleswoman. 
Um, and in that sense, she was very interesting because many of the claims she made about herself were false, but endearingly false. I mean, so that you get to the point where you say, oh, Doris, you're not saying that again, are you? So you're going to publish an article or on her? No, it's a book. Oh, it's a book? Yeah, it's a book. Oh, yeah. excellent. Yeah, it's a book. So when can we expect that? Still working on it. Okay. Have to wait another year or so. Okay, so literary agents uh, starting in the 40s, who are some of the, the better known ones then? In Canada? Yeah. Well, the better, Over the known, years. The better, better known agents in Canada really didn't start to kick in until the 1970s. So the territory was more or less owned by um, Matty Molinaro. Uh, but in fact, Molinaro didn't even really start as a literary agent. What she started out was uh, as a manager of speaker services. That is, uh, you know, she had some big names like Marshall McLuhan. She would represent them, but she would get them speaking engagements. She wasn't really uh, functioning as um, a conventional literary agent mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, eventually, she did morph into a more conventional agent. Okay. And by the by the seventies, uh, some of the uh, you know the literary agencies that we still see existing today that have become quite large companies like who uh, were starting to phase in. Well, one of the earlier agents was uh, Bella Palmer, but we also have you know Westwood Creative Agency, and you know th th there are many others. Uh, you know, it's th there's several agencies in Toronto today that have their roots back in um, you know in the seventies and eighties. One of the things I found. Really interesting was the fact that literary agents, they didn't just negotiate for advances. They, and I think somewhere, you, I'm just looking for it here, you say that, that there was something like 26 different category of rights that, this was quite right. a ways back, that they negotiated for him, including playing cards and cigarette that's right. That's Boxes? Right. Those are all known as subsidiary rights. Right. And in the beginning, most authors didn't know a thing about subsidiary rights. Uh, a, a good example of that was uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery, mm -hmm. uh, who negotiated a contract with American publisher but didn't know anything about the film industry at the time. So uh, she negotiated that contract without an agent and failed to secure the film rights that was under, with Page, right? Under her name, yeah, with Page in the States uh, for Anne of Green Gables. Right. So uh, Page was able to sell the film rights to that without paying her a penny. Yeah, that's uh, appalling, isn't it? Appalling, yeah. But there's all kinds of other examples of this. You know, the, the, the author that creates a sort of memorable, memorable character that's then turned into a doll, but uh, they forgot to protect their rights uh, on that so they can walk into any store and see their doll being sold, but they're not getting a penny for it. So the, uh, another, another responsibility of the agent is to protect those rights that are not right there, you know, out in front for everybody to see. An agent has to be able to think down the road, well, what if this is successful? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we protect the author in the future? But don't, you just, just, don't you just say, we retain all the rights except for the book? Well, that would be really nice, except then the publisher wouldn't publish it, because the publishers also want those rights. So what the agent is really engaged in is, is uh, negotiating a partnership between the author and the publisher. So what, what typically happens in those situations is that the subsidiary rights are split on a percentage basis between the author and the publisher. And there's different formulas for the way in which that split takes place. So subsidiary rights, that's a catch-all for everything. It could be television, it could be uh, it toys. radio, it could be toys, it could be playing cards, it could be uh, what's called serial publication, publication in magazines. Uh, it could be uh, you know, television, film, okay. dramatic performances, plays, that type of thing. Okay. You mentioned the Canada Council. If you could just tell me exactly what, I mean, aside from just injecting money into the system, what, what did they do? How did they, how did they help nurture a, a publishing industry in Canada? Well, uh, when we look back at the, uh, the impact of the Canada Council, which was founded in 1957, what we begin to see is that the, the effects uh, of the founding of the Council in terms of funding for artists and cultural groups began to take effect in the 1960s. 
So if we look at the, the 1960s, if we look at the mid-1960s, moving up toward the end of the 1960s, and then into the early 1970s, we, we're entering a period of what we typically call the explosion in Canadian literature. Yeah, Nick and Mount writes about that in his arrival, right? Right, right. And, and we, we, we call it the explosion because uh, this new funding allowed for the creation of new publishing houses that never could have existed before, for the founding of magazines that, that, that were promoting experimental writing. Uh, you had what was very, you know, uh, sort of purist, Puritan um, ethos. But we have to remember also that it wasn't just books. I mean, it was ballet companies, it was operas, mm -hmm. it was museums. It universities. Was yeah. Painters, universities. Mm -hmm. So you, you had a kind of cultural boom uh, that, that came out of that investment. Um, and um, because the investment continued on an annual basis and because with some pullbacks and increases the government has continued to support the Canada Council, uh, we, you know, we're very fortunate to have been able to see that investment. And I think that today uh, we would not have the same conception of the country uh, if that investment had not been made. Yeah, it's very profoundly important. Mm -hmm. And the same for the CBC. Mm -hmm. You make reference to the fact that there are approximately a thousand literary agents in the United States and only 30 in Canada, whereas there sh theoretically there should be a hundred. Theoretically there should be a hundred, but I, I think 30 might be being a bit generous. Uh, I mean, if you really counted the bodies, uh, you'd probably get to 30. But, uh, in, in, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, actual agents, with historic experience who are still continuing in their roles as opposed to interns or people who come in and out of the agency business you know for a year and then they they leave for for the real people that have, have experience in the industry is probably less than that and that that says something about the the size of the Canadian publishing industry it also says something about the massiveness of competition from the United States you have to be pretty tenacious in order to hold on in Canada. And, uh, you know, I have enormous respect for the agents out there that have held on, because it's not easy. Why isn't it easy? It's not easy to sell a book. It's not easy to sell a book when you see publishers diminishing. It's not easy to sell a book when you see that the criteria <coughs> adopted by publishers in order to accept a book are changing. Yeah, and like publishing. selling 200,000 copies, exactly. or $200,000, I guess it is, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, they, they want those big sellers, and, well, from a business point of view, one can understand it. I mean, they're not there to give away money. They're no. there to make money. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the smaller publishers, but those small publishers can't afford to pay much in the way of advances. So you could have an agency, a typical agent's uh, commission is 15%. So you can see that an agent who sells a book to a small publisher for an advance of $1,000 takes home $150. But you also have to remember that because advances to authors are not usually paid in one lump sum, but often divided into three portions, sometimes even more, uh, the, the first take that uh, an agent might have from that sale for a $1,000 advance might be something in the vicinity of $40. <laughs> or fifty dollars, so uh, you know it's not exactly a money, uh, you know, money-making proposition. And there's usually something else that I think must drive these agents on, uh, other than the pure desire for money, because it's 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 possibly not the best business you could be in. Well, I've heard that about publishing so many times in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you make the point here. In many instances, the kind of literature that gets presented to Canadian publishers is the direct result of decisions made by a small group of people again and again. That's right. So in that sense, it's not an open market in the ideal conception. That mm. is, we, we're not living in a system where any author can submit any work to any publisher. We're not living in a system where any, any author can make multiple submissions to all kinds of publishers. Most authors don't know how to do that. And... Um, you know, publishers sometimes resent the effort that they may put into evaluating a manuscript only to find out that it's been taken by the guy down the block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's not necessarily the best route to follow, whereas with agencies it's usually assumed that there are going to be multiple submissions uh, because that's the nature of the business. I was just in France recently and uh, I interviewed some publishers and some 
literary agents. The French do not like literary agents. French publishers don't want to deal with them. That's right, because, because, the, because the French agents who exist have a much more aggressive attitude toward selling their books and want to get in there and um, you know, get their hands a bit more dirty than, than the North American agents. I'm not saying that North American agents don't want to get in there and fight for their authors. Part of the issue in France is that the publishers want to do the editing with the writers. And that's a kind of sacrosanct relationship that they don't want to deal with a middleman on. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, as a literary agent, how much time do you spend editing a writer's work? Oh, very little. Little? Very, very little. I mean, uh, no, I'm not an editor. But uh, isn't that one of the main roles of a literary agent in no, I don't North see America? It that way. Uh, you don't see it that way, or no, that's I, not I the way it is? I don't see it that way. No, I, I don't think that that's the way it is, and I don't see it that way. Okay. I mean, it, it's true that, that agents can be very interventive uh, in, a, in a writer's work. And in other words, they can say to the writer, you know, this doesn't work here, or I think you should put this scene earlier, or I don't think the opening works, um, or, you know, you have some passages here that I think are weak or the dialogue falls off. The agent can point that out to the author, but there's very few agents, they do exist, who will actually get in there and try to restructure that prose or try to you know, work in depth with the text. You know, there have been uh, editors like that. Or agents. And yeah. There have been agents like that as well. Uh, often that task falls to um, an editor who is within the publishing company. Yeah, yeah. That, well, as I say, that's funny because I, our, my understanding was that the English language literary agents are much more involved in the actual editing process to get the manuscript to a point where it can then be presented to mm -hmm. the publisher well, versus I, what it's like in France. Mm -hmm. I think we have to distinguish between editing and making re recommendations for improvement in the structure or presentation of the, um, of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I've got an author who uh, you know, started out with one idea and uh, it didn't seem to me to be working and I would say to her, well, you know, maybe, what are you really writing about? Can you try a couple of exercises so we can figure out what it is that you're really writing about? And then she would try another draft and I would say, I don't think that's it, but I think I see a little bit more of a glimmer of what you're, what you're getting at here. Can you try to push it in this direction? Try another draft. I try another draft, and I would say, oh, now, now I can see this idea emerging. Maybe this is what you're writing about. And she would say, actually, yes, that is what I, what I want to write about. So then I would say, well, like, now that we know what you want to write about, let's try another draft, which is really focused on that. So what I'm saying is, I'm not doing the rewriting. No, but you're making case. important suggestions. Yeah, I'm not saying to her, um, this word is wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, but what I am yeah. saying to her is, let's get the conception and the presentation right so that it's clear, so that a publisher will understand exactly what's new and different about this, this book, and so that I can feel good going out to sell it. So I understand yeah. what it is that's unique about this so that I can sell it to a publisher. And sometimes that takes time. So if that's called editing, then I guess agents are editors. Um, but, but not in the sense of what we call a line editor. That is somebody who's working on every sentence, you know, the syntax, yeah. the prose, the, you know, the actual grammar, punctuation. I see. In other words, what you're doing is you're helping the uh, author to get their manuscript to a point where it be accepted by a publisher. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then the publisher will do that heavy-duty editorial right. work in-house. Okay. Yeah, because you've got to earn your keep somehow. Well, if you spent all your time editing these books, you know, you, you could never read the other books that were coming in, That's right. and uh, you'd quickly be out of business. Speaking of which, how is business these days? How is, how is my business? Well, Your uh, business or the literary agency business in Canada and in North America? You know, I don't think that anybody is jumping up and down saying they're, they're doing great and hallelujah and the time has come and... Um, we're making all kinds of money, and, and this model is succeeding beautifully. Uh, I just think that anything connected with publishing is always going to be a challenge. And especially living in times where the nature of publishing, publishing is changing so radically, when authors are now empowered to publish their own work, 
uh, which bypasses the agents and the publishers completely. And you know, even if you have a success in publishing, you may have a massive success in one year, but then you could have a dry dry years for two years. You know, so so um, it's sometimes misleading to think about whether we live in you know really great times for agents or not, because I think it's the same for publishers. There are, in fact, a lot of strong parallels between the business of being an agent or running a literary agency and the business of being a publisher or running a publishing company. Uh, both the agent and the publisher have to decide what will sell. Uh, both the agent and the publisher have to think about how to present this idea uh, in a marketable way. And both the agent and the publisher have to have an idea of who is the audience for this book and how will it stand out uh, from other books. So to ask about the success of agencies is also to, to ask about the success of publishers. And it's kind of a roller coaster. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe there are some uh, agents out there that are consistently just doing great. But I would be surprised. Well, when you think of it, I mean, there's Penguin Random House, there's HarperCollins, mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of smaller companies. That's, right. That's about it That's right. in Canada. That's right. So uh, when, I, when, I, when I take on a new author, and if their book is, is strictly intended for the Canadian audience, I can say to them with pretty good assurance, well, we'll know everything we, we will possibly know in about 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, in under a month, you're yeah. going to know uh, pretty much. You're going to have heard from all the Canadian publishers because there's so few of them. You're talking about the, the, the manuscript as a product, as a commodity, when you're talking about, is it going to sell? I, I, I touched on it before, but that sort of works against anything that's unusual. Uh, why? Some commodities sell very well, and some don't. No, but you're angling towards something that's going to sell, rather than something that's really good, or different, or challenging, or... Well, uh, when I was a publisher, I would often publish books on wrestling. Uh, they sold very well. I didn't know a thing about wrestling. Uh, I'm sure there's a fine art to wrestling, yeah. you know, but, but the books were commodities, and uh, they sold. Uh, celebrity biographies sell, uh, or at least they did sell. Does that mean that they're necessarily high-quality works of art? Uh, no. Uh, they are commodities and they have their market. Is a Big Mac the best hamburger that's ever been made? No, but it's a commodity. Uh, it has its market. So everything that's for sale is a commodity in one form or another. Uh, it just depends um, how we're going to package that commodity and uh, how we see it on the scale of other commodities, from my point of view. Well, it's interesting. As you look at James Joyce's Ulysses, no one would publish that because they were scared of the fact mm -hmm. that it was obscene. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Sylvia Beach said, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, just remember the great Canadian novel that was banned in large parts of Canada because it contained the word fart. Was that by Margaret Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, again, I'm just saying, though, that all of, the, all of this commercial talk has nothing to do with great literature necessarily. And, and, and uh, so that's obviously you're not idealistic then. There's a difference between being idealistic and practical. I, I, I can believe in a work. I can think it's the greatest work of art ever. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be published. It, it, it probably won't be. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's, it's necessarily uh, you know, going to find a, a publisher. And um, one of the reasons that people sometimes uh, start publishing companies is because they can't find a publisher um, you know, who believes in their work. Well, like Mel, I think didn't Melville? Melville paid for his for Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. I, think. I think. I I think that's right, and um, I think that uh, in the beginning, Virginia Woolf paid for a lot of her own yeah. books uh, right. as well. Well, uh, yeah, and as you as you say, they set up their own publishing house. That's right. You know, there's all kinds of variations on this. Today, we would call that vanity publishing. But we look down our nose at it now. That's right. Yeah. So what you're saying is. It's not a terrific time to be a, a literary agent right now. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was... There, there are the great famous agents, you know, in, in, in New York who would have those martini lunches and 
they had all the publishers in their pocket because they owned these great properties, and the great properties were the writers. And the writers would sit there and produce these fabulous works, and then the agent would, you know, take the publisher out to a martini lunch and over lunch clinch the deal. And it was all very nice and sociable. Um, you know, I don't think that that's the way it's done uh, these days, at least that's not the way it's done with me. It becomes harder to sell books, the bar is higher, and so agents have to be aware of what, what's necessary to, you know, get over that bar. Um, and, and it means that you have to be out there thinking about the marketplace. But, but the other thing is that um, the audience and writers tend to think of their books in the moment. That is, particularly in terms of nonfiction, uh, often writers will propose an idea that seems particularly relevant to them now. So, uh, you know, let's write about Trump, or let's write about American politics, or let's write about um, authoritarianism. Uh, but in fact, you know, the publishing cycle is a year or two. Mm -hmm. So uh, from the time that book is contracted to the time it appears might be two years later. And the publisher is it's still saying, that long, is it? Even well, with you know, they can rush print? it. Right. They can rush it, but there's still, you know, two seasons in publishing. Uh, fall and spring. Yeah. So the publisher can rush it, but the bottom line is that, uh, you know, often they can't get there enough to capitalize on that idea. So the publisher has to sort of have a bit of a crystal ball and say, you know, where are we going to be in a year from now or two years from now, not where are we today? And um, so the author who wants to make a good nonfiction proposal has to begin thinking in the same way. That is, you know, what's happening today is not what's going to be happening a year from now. Or, what am I writing about that, that will be consistently interesting? Timeless, that, that, you want. That's timeless, that, yeah. that, that transcends you know, what's going on right now, but has something to offer people that will be good five years from now. You know, yeah. and, and a question I often find myself saying to authors is, you've got a great idea here, but I want you to explain how is it going to affect me. You know, explain in simple language how is this going to affect people in their everyday lives. Don't give it to me in like philosophical phrases. Just explain how it's going to affect people in their everyday lives. And you know, I think that's quite an important distinction. What other questions? If someone's listening and they they've got a they've got a manuscript or they're they've got a, a book they're writing and they want an agent, what, what other questions do you like? Do you get lots of people banging your door down to be uh, to be their agent? Probably about uh, fifteen inquiries every day. Seriously? Yeah, 15 to 20. Surprisingly, many of them from people who are incarcerated. I, I would say the, the, the greatest number of people submitting are people who are in prison. We can speculate about why that would be, but um, <laughs> other frequent people who want to get book published are people who have undergone religious conversion or, or people who have suffered trauma and uh, want to tell their story about getting out of that, which is all very legitimate but not necessarily the kind of book that can, can be sold. So um, it, it, it's sometimes difficult to express concisely. There's no, there's no specific formula for this, but the author has to be able to ask him or herself, you know, what does this book do for people beyond me? Uh, what, what is it going to give people? Uh, what, what, what is it about the narrative in this book? And non-fiction books have a narrative as well. What, what is it about the narrative in this book that's going to move my reader forward? Why should they want to complete it? Why should they want to turn the pages? Uh, you know, what is there in there that I've put in that makes them want to find out where this story is going? To me, that's the most important question. Yeah. So that when you read manuscripts, you're asking yourself that, uh, well, you, when you're reading your, your one page, uh, if you don't turn the page, then you're not going to accept them as a as a client. Right. But, but, but the other thing is in the prose, the quality of the prose itself. I mean, you can tell a good writer by the quality of their prose very quickly. A weak writer will reveal, will reveal themselves through the quality of their prose almost immediately. So what other questions go through your head when you, you're thinking about uh, who to accept as a client? What has this person done before? Does their writing interest me at the level of prose? What kind of network are they involved in? 
What kind of relevance does this book have to a wide market? Are there particular publishers that might be interested in this kind of work because of the, you know, the, the profile they have as a publisher, the kind of books they do? Does this book have a unique twist or does it have a hook? Uh, something that you look at and you say, that's original, I've never seen that before, or I never thought of that. And uh, it comes at you quickly because the author has done a good job of packaging it. It's important to remember that a book has to be packaged for an agent, just like the agent has to package it for the publisher. So a good package coming in your door would answer all those questions? I think so. Would try to. Would be aware of them, mm -hmm. um, at least. Whose uh, work would you uh, suggest that writers, if not emulate, then be, a, be aware of? You mean contemporary writers? Yeah. Oh, there's such a, there's, there's so many. Uh, if you could limit it to a handful. Well, I've always been a fan of Michael Ondaatje's work uh, in Canadian writing. Uh, you know, in, in American writing right now, actually, I'm not sure if she's American or British. This is an author who uh, grew up in Canada. Uh, I think then she moved to L.A., and now I think she lives in England. But her name is uh, Rachel Cusk. Mm -hmm. And um, she's got uh, some, uh, a beautiful trilogy. Um, uh, of books, quite a unique writer, I think. Mm. Um, I'm also reading an American um, writer right now by the name of Rachel Kushner, uh, yeah. and um, she's got a fantastic style, very, very engaging, very interesting. I mean, both of those writers couldn't be more apart in terms of their style, mm -hmm. but they're both geniuses, stylistic geniuses. What about nonfiction? I don't read that much nonfiction. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I read the newspaper, uh, I read uh, online stuff, but I don't buy uh, nonfiction books um, that much. But you represent a lot. I of represent nonfiction, nonfiction and, and 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 another problem which you're which you're sort of getting at here is that I don't have that much time to read the things I want to read. Mm -hmm. You know, which is which is a problem uh, for me. I, I I read nonfiction, but it tends to be what. Uh, my clients submit. Right. It ten tends to be what, what comes in on the transom. Um, and then when I can, I steal away and, you know, secretly read novels uh, <laughs> that, that have nothing to do with my, my business or my teaching. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to find that time. I mean, if I, I told you how long it takes me to read one novel, it would be very embarrassing. I don't think it would be because I'm a really slow reader as well. I, if I read something, I want to get as much as I can from it, and yeah. it takes forever. Yeah, well, I get my iPad, you know, get into bed, get my iPad open, okay, this is my relaxation time, I'm going to read that novel, and then three minutes later, curtains, Funny so uh, it becomes very yeah. difficult. Just to finally, um, where do you think the, the literary agency business is headed, uh, say five years from now, what do you think it will look like? Again, I think the, the problem with the agencies, and, and, and don't hold me to specific names here, is going to be the same problem uh, with publishing, and that is that it's generational, uh, in the sense that the experienced agents are not people who are in their 30s or even their 40s. You know, there are people who may be retiring in the next 5, 10 years, mm -hmm. and who's going to replace them? Uh, when we experienced that explosion in Canadian literature that I was talking about in the 60s and 70s, the people who were starting these companies you know, they were in their 30s. Uh, they were young, and, and, and they, were, they were in the trenches, and they were doing all the hard work um, because the resources and the, the passion and the interest was there. But now we're talking about, uh, you know, taking over businesses that are complicated, that, uh, you know, where you need to have a certain amount of experience. You can't just walk in and say, oh, it would be nice to, you know, run that agency that has 15 employees or whatever. Um, you can't just do that. So the number of people who are really qualified uh, to step into the shoes of those who are occupying those agency positions right now, I think, are few and far between. That is itself going to become an issue because, you know, to go back to an earlier point in our conversation, agents still are acting as gatekeepers for those publishers. So as the gatekeepers decrease in number, that whole business of communication between the writer and the publisher will become more difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and who knows 
what will come from that difficulty. Do you think the business is going to shrink or expand? I think publishing in general is shrinking. And, and, and uh, the reason I think it's shrinking is because there are so many distractions out there now. There, there are so many things that people are attracted to. Uh, it's not that they're not reading. It's just that their reading has become fragmented and immediate and saturated with many different influences and forces. We don't have the single book or even the little pile of books sitting on our desk anymore. We're bombarded with information left, right, and center. So that even today, when I say to myself, should I buy that book, it's often a question of, uh, should I buy that book, or should I watch this program on Netflix, or, or should I get onto my news feed and read all of these stories that are being churned out all the time, or you know, what, what should I follow, what should I invest in? And, uh, you know, as the possibilities increase, the focus of, you know, the book buyer and the focus of the publisher on the specific book necessarily has to become diluted. Yeah, the, um, it's kind of a dopamine draw, the, the whole social media thing. It's like uh, uh, there's the interaction with other they're, they're humans. They may be kind of electronically connected with you, but... Yeah. The fact that someone's acknowledging your little tweet or something that you've said or done and they give you positive feedback, you, you don't get that when you're reading a book, even though reading a book is, a, is, is probably, at least in my experience, the most fulf- a really great book is the mm-hmm. most fulfilling, one of the most fulfilling activities you can engage mm-hmm. in. No, I agree with you, but somebody should do a study about what's happened to our attention span mm-hmm. no, I think in terms they're already of in, uh, yeah. reading books because I know this is a very bad thing but I, I know that when I'm reading books now my phone is always buzzing mm-hmm. you know there's some new Twitter thing and then the temptation becomes well I'm not going to actually look at that now because I'm supposed to be reading this book yeah. but then it buzzes a few more times and you think maybe this is important <laughs> so you know, you pick it up, and before you know it, you're down another rabbit hole with some news story, uh, and now now it's 15 minutes later because you've followed that story and you've done your reading, And but what about the book you were reading? You've got to leave the phone and the iPad in another room is what you've got to do. Mm-hmm. Maybe, right. maybe literary agents should be replaced by some kind of specialist who can teach us how to do that. Uh, you know, to leave the phone and the iPad in, in another room. The, the mm. problem is, though, the book is on our iPad. I think uh, there's a new calling for addiction counselors. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments, uh, just in closing, about your business, your study of the field? Well, the field of Canadian literature is changing dramatically. So, uh, at one level, uh, you know, I, I respond to those changes as an academic who's been teaching Canadian literature for more years than I care to think about, and um, you know that's that's one way of seeing the change. Um, but that's not a business. Um, so, you know, I've I've always looked at what's happening in the industry and what's happening in Canadian literature uh, from two perspectives. One is as a person who's you know in a classroom talking to young people about what a national literature means and how it's changed over time and how we can go about looking at it and how we can understand from a historical perspective, which often gets lost today, more and more it's getting lost, but how we also have to understand um, what makes literature contemporary and and how authors fit into social patterns and how authors do respond to the conditions of their environment, you know, be they they actually environmental or be they commercial. Or, 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 or be they familial, the agency business is interesting because it plugs you into the material side of things in, in a way that um, the pedagogical side doesn't. So, you know, I guess I feel very fortunate in being able to, to see both of those sides, and my own experience has been that 20-year-olds, you know, students coming into university, really have no idea about that other side. Uh, you know, what I've called the material side of this book production or the material side of how art is created. I guess I'm just glad that I've had access to that uh, in a way that I can share it with my students. So you do bring the material into oh, the classroom. That's, well, thanks for bringing the pedagogical and the material into our conversation. Thank you very much, Nigel. 
I've been speaking with Robert Lecker, who is the Green Shields Professor of English at McGill University in Montreal and the owner of the Robert Lecker Literary Agency. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Nigel.